Well, good morning, everybody. Um, hope that you're all well. Um, it has been a while for me uh, since I've led Sunday school. I think it's been six weeks, something like that at this point. Um, that, last, uh, that last Sunday in June was my last time. And um, here it is, the second Sunday in August. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a while. It's been it's been about uh, six Sundays. Yeah. So I'm glad to be back, and um, just uh, thankful for uh, the fellows stepping in, Phil, Jeff, and uh, others uh, who uh, stepped in and filled in during Sunday school, and uh, and then during the service as well. Uh, but we are going to just pick up where we left off um, in Matthew 18. I have to apologize. I don't have a I don't have an outline for you if you don't have one. Uh, just it, it just uh, I ran out of time this week to uh, to look into that. Well, the truth is that it just kind of slipped through the cracks as I was kind of finishing my Saturday uh, preparations and all that. So um, so I just would have you turn to Matthew chapter 18, and we will. Um, <clears throat> Just kind of work through the chapter and see how uh, far we get through it, uh, not using an outline. So, um, so I, I, I think we'll be okay. I think there's. Uh, I'll kind of use an outline up here on the board probably as we uh, as we uh, work through it. But this is a uh, just a a, um, a chapter that is full of uh, of important teaching. Every I mean every word that comes from God's mouth is uh, is important. He doesn't waste words. Um, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by Every word, you know, that comes from God's mouth, meaning that they're all purposeful. Um, but there are some chapters that it seems like are uh, are just full of maybe uh, uh, teaching that's that's maybe a little more a little more maybe pertinent to the time that we're in, uh, and um, and that's subjective, you know, because we're because uh, we're deciding what's more pertinent. It's always pertinent. It's always relevant, regardless of what it is. But some things maybe speak to things we struggle with a little bit more. And uh, so that's why I think it's important for us to, to uh, be especially mindful and uh, have listening ears as we uh, look at particular chapters such as this one. So let me, uh, let me start off by just reading verses 1 to 4 of Matthew 18, and then I'll pray. So verses 1 to 4, <clears throat> and then I'll pray. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let me just continue by reading the next two verses, just verses five and six. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Let's pray. So, Father, teach us uh, today on the Lord's Day, by your Spirit, true humility, true godliness, true Christlikeness. Make us be children in God's hand, who trust him and, uh, and lean on him. And I pray, O oh Lord, that we would see in Jesus not only the example to follow, but the one in whom we should believe and place our hope and our trust. And we pray that you would bless just this uh, short time that we spend here uh, before morning worship. Be with us, shepherd us, bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, um, you'll notice the first thing there that happens is a question. Uh, The disciples come up to him and they ask him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This is a question that would be well at home uh, in our uh, our day today. Everybody's always talking about who the greatest is in various various fields. Um, I mean, even, even I guess the year after I was born, the movie Top Gun came out, and you might remember if you're familiar with that, uh, Maverick and Iceman arguing over who was the best uh, among them, and uh, that kind of still remains up in the air. If you follow the saga, you know they kind of Maverick's great in some ways, Iceman was great in other ways, and all that. And they were arguing about that. Now the debate is over in basketball: 
who's the greatest, Michael Jordan or LeBron James in football, who's the greatest, Tom Brady, or most people don't have anybody to put next to him. They just say it's Tom Brady. Uh, I, have, I have some disagreements with that, but, uh, but I won't go into all that. Everybody's still wondering who the greatest is. And, uh, and here, back in the first century, they were asking the same question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus goes into this teaching here using a child, calling to him a child. He puts, them, he puts uh, him in the midst of them. He says, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is, I think this is kind of a startling way to answer this. Jesus often did this, didn't he? He, he answered in kind of startling ways, not in inappropriate ways, uh, but in ways that maybe surprised them. And uh, he, would, he would, sometimes they'd ask a question and he would answer the question that they should be asking, so it would seem like he wasn't responding to them, but he was. He was just answering the question underneath their question. Other times, he would answer the question that they were asking with something that was very direct, lucid, and cogent. And, um, and I think this is one example of that. To argue about who the greatest is in the kingdom of heaven is to speculate about things that only God sees. Um, the reason why Adam and Eve weren't supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because man is not equipped or called to be able to handle the full knowledge of good and evil. There's a reason Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged. You, you're not made to know everything. Um, we're, we're prone to fall and that's why we fell in the garden. And um, in a question like this is something that Jesus could have responded to by saying, that's not for, that's not for you to know. Um, in fact, you remember when James and John come asking a similar question, can we sit at your right and left hand uh, in your kingdom? Uh, he says, you know, that's not, he even says it's not for me to decide. I think that's what he says. Uh, it's for the Father to decide. It, just the idea is, and then when they say in Acts 1, will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? He says, um, you know, that's, that's, not a, that's not for you to know times and places. That's for the Father to know. But here, he just looks them in the eye, brings a child, and says, if you want to be great, you've got to become like this. I'm not saying, he's, he's saying, I'm not saying you've got to undergo some kind of plastic surgery where you become a child literally again. He's saying that like a child is simple, humble, dependent on mom and dad, and they know it, and even if they don't know it, they, uh, they still unwittingly depend on mom and dad. That's how you need to be. Greatness is quantified, he says, by an unforced humility. If it's, an un, if it's a forced humility, it's not a real humility, right? Um, but an unforced humility is a true sense of lowliness. And that's what Jesus is saying. Greatness in the kingdom is not quantified by works, power, or stature, but by childlike lowliness. Childlike lowliness. Not domineering, but living responsibly as God has revealed godliness is supposed to look, and then trusting him to take you along for the ride. Just living your life going that way, um, trusting the Lord. And you think about it, um, we, were out, uh, we were out with uh, George and Diana yesterday out at the lake, and, um, and uh, Isaiah got into the water for the first time. Um, and uh, that's a change, that's a development. You know, Isaiah's very, very timid with a lot of different things. Um, and that's deep water out there, you know, when you're out at the lake. It's pretty deep. And he's got his life jacket on and all of that. Um, but he's, he's, a timid, he's a timid little guy. Um, to be quite honest, when you're out in the middle of the lake, I'm a timid little guy, actually. I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like a little nervous as I'm getting out there and all that. And, uh, and I get in the water and a current kind of comes and sweeps my legs out from under me. And I'm like, oh, I'm getting out. Not really. Um, there's something, I was thinking about this while I was out there yesterday. Um, 
the reason why he's willing uh, to do it and the reason why he's willing to get out there is because mom and dad are out there. He wouldn't do it on his own. Uh, he probably wouldn't even do it if it was George out there. Um, but because mom and dad are in the water, he trusts them. And so he's willing to, he's willing to try different things and take a step into the unknown. Um, and I just think that's kind of a, it's a, a bit of a snapshot of what Jesus is talking about. Um, if your father goes before you, you're willing to go um, because you trust him. And so you just continue to step into the unknown. And if you think like that, you're not concerned with greatness, stature, and respect and things like that, like what they're asking about here and like what they uh, seem to be concerned with. You're just concerned with living life a day at a time and um, going as the Father leads you. And that's what, that's what Jesus is getting at here. This is, it's a call to lowliness, it's a call to humility, uh, it's a call to start over, essentially. And we don't just stay. I think, we, I think we remain in some sense childlike all of our days. But we're also supposed to grow up as Christians, right? You know, grow up into every way, in every way into Christ who is the head. Um, but we never really lose that kind of lowliness, right? Um, this is kind of where the illustration, you know, breaks down a little bit because not because no illustration even in scripture it's never really you know perfect uh, in the sense that it can be used you know to to the nth degree and applied to the nth degree that's not the purpose of an illustration usually illustrations make you know maybe one point maybe just a couple of points or something like that um, but like there's going to come a day probably when Isaiah who is willing to step into the unknown because daddy's out there, there probably will come a day when he's going to take care of me. Um, he's going to be the strong one. I'm going to be the weak one. That's probably coming one of these days. Um, that never happens with us and God, right? But that same closeness that Isaiah and I have now, I hope we will have then. Um, and yet he has grown and he has matured and as I get weaker, that closeness sort of reverses the roles a little bit. Now, in a similar, maybe analogical way, but not a totally equal way, we never have to take care of God, right? But our closeness with him as father and child um, is the foundation on top of which we experience everything as Christians. So even if even if we end up doing great things that we never thought possible. Um, you know, Kevin, if you go on a mission trip to, to Africa and preach the gospel in front of thousands of people or something like that, that just seems, right now, that seems out of the realm of possibility. Not possibility, but it just seems unlikely, right? But if that were to happen, and you were to do something that that is beyond you, you would you'd be willing because you know that your father's with you. And, um, and that's that kind of closeness, that bond that Jesus is illustrating here by bringing this child uh, and then talking about the father. That's what he's getting at here. Greatness is quantified by understanding your relationship to God the father in truth and then going from there. Um, it's not about stature, it's not about respect, it's about um, childhood with God and, uh, and then trusting him even as we grow and as we mature. I'm trying to think if I've missed anything on this, uh, on this thing. Any thoughts on that before I make one more quick point before I, and move on? Go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. To us as men, in particular, even if we don't have children, uh, let the children come on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. 
Absolutely, without, without a question. Um, that's greatness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It, it's not a, um, you know, it's not a shot to your ego at all. You're not, uh, you're not insulted that you know you're in a position of needing prayer from one of your children. It's it's a blessing, and that's uh, that that's what it's supposed to be like. So yeah, just for those uh, for those listening, perhaps who uh, who couldn't hear. Those listening uh, on the uh, video, just uh, Kevin talking about the the relationship between him and his son, and when his son prayed for him in a hard time, that kind of reversal of roles um, is a welcome uh, a welcome maturation. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing, and I think that's sort of an analogy of uh, of what Jesus expects from us as we grow and as we mature. Again, perhaps even do things that, that are beyond us. It's never, we never get to a place where we're not dependent on God. Perhaps this is actually where the illustration continues. I owe, regardless of if I get to a place where I'm taking care of you know, either one of my parents, totally taking care of them, um, I, uh, I will never stop owing them for who I am. I'll, like, without them, I don't exist, right? This is why, this is why the command is to honor your father and mother. Um, God didn't need to say this, but that's why he didn't say it, but he could have said, because without them, you're not even here. Um, so in that sense, even if I get to a place where I'm physically, maybe even mentally stronger and they're caring for them, I still, like... I'm never in a position where I don't depend on them to some degree. Um, so I don't know. Obviously, I'm, obviously I haven't figured out how to not just, uh, just think out loud here in Sunday school. Six weeks away, and I'm still just getting up here in Sunday school and thinking out loud. Um, but I just think it's a, we can kind of probe into these illustrations even more and just see, see depth to it. Your hand was up, Peter. Yeah. Figured, I figured you would go. You would go there, because. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. That's the, that's the last thing I want to mention before we move on is about, is about infant baptism. Um, but but let, me, let me just backtrack quickly. So, uh, again, those listening, Peter's uh, making the point about the importance of uh, conversion here because Jesus, in the ESV, unless you turn and become like children, but uh, in your version there, unless you're converted. In the New King James, Yeah, New King, yeah. Uh, um, strafete in, uh, in the Greek, you may be turning... Um, so it's not a, it, it, it's not that kind of metanoia, repentance, change of mind. It's a literal physical turning. Um, so unless you, and it's it's illustrative of a change of the mindset. Unless you have a substantial change, um, uh, th so that you become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Same thing as when Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born. 
uh, of water and the spirit, you'll never enter uh, the kingdom. That's that idea of entering the kingdom. There he says you must be born again. Here he says you must turn and become like children. I think that this is descriptive of what that, that uh, born again process is. It's when we find ourselves changing where, to where we see God truly as our father and ourselves as his sons or daughters. And, uh, and we really want to please him and we depend on him. You know, that kind of change, that's, that's what happens in that conversion process. And uh, Jesus says, without that, you can't, can't enter the kingdom. Go ahead, Paul. Absolutely. Yeah. It should be our attitude. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting, again, so for those, I'm trying to do a better job of repeating what people say on the recording so that they can, uh, they can hear that. Um, just uh, Paul's making the point that, that that attitude of childlike dependence that children have on, on mom and dad, uh, that's something that, that we keep you know, throughout our lives. Uh, again, back to the illustration of the time, even if I'm physically or, or whatever stronger than mom and dad, I still always owe them for my, for my being. Um, and so that's an analogy of us and God because in one sense, it's not exactly parallel because I'm still always depending on him for everything. I never get to a place where I'm stronger than him. Um, but nevertheless, uh, part of that includes that's, that continued attitude that I have towards my parents, regardless of age, that I owe him my, my being. And uh, to your point, Paul, you know, I think that, you know, when Jesus said, pray like this, um, he didn't mean pray like this when you first start and then your prayer your prayer will mature to the point where you don't need to pray like this anymore. These are timeless, um, realistic truth. When I say realistic, I, I mean um, parts of what make reality what it is. He is the one who has to give me my daily bread or I'm not going to get it. I could try and try and try. And if God is against me, I'm not going to get it what it is that I'm trying for. Now, he's not against me. I'm going to talk more about this in the sermon this morning, especially if I'm a believer and I, I trust in him. Um, but even if not, he gives the sun and the rain to the just and the unjust, the good and the bad. There's nobody who, is, who exists who has not been basking in God's providence and goodness the entirety of their lives, even if, they have, even if they've gone through painful lives and difficult things. They still have had more good than bad. And that kind of, I think that's part of that shift, that turning that happens when we, uh, as Peter mentioned, when we're converted. It's going from that attitude of, why me, God? Why, why this? Why that? To, you know, which is implying, I feel like I, sh I deserve better. To saying, actually, I have been deeply loved and blessed the whole of my life with some thorns and thistles. Um, so, Lord, I depend on you every day, not only for the daily bread, but think about the other um, supplications in the Lord's Prayer, forgiveness of sins. Lord, I thought my sins were forgiven at the cross, but he says, pray for forgiveness, 
as you forgive. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And now I'm not going to go into a deep explanation of all the ins and outs of what that means, but Jesus is making the point that if you have not understood um, the grace of God to the point where you also don't have grace towards others and uh, willingness to forgive, um, then yeah, it's, per- it's possible you've not understood the grace of God and uh, haven't been forgiving. Actually, we're, he's going to be talking about that later on in this chapter. Um, his, uh, his leading, lead me not into temptation, because they're all around and they're inside of me. I need the Lord to lead me and to, to divert my attention. Deliver me from evil. The evil one is all around me all the time. Stirring up my flesh. Boy, you never, never graduate from needing Christ. That's why Hebrews says that he continually lives to make intercession for the transgressors. We never get to a point where we are not needing his intercession anymore. Um, He is always interceding for us, always keeping us clean, always washing our feet, as it were. Um, So, um, infant baptism. Let's talk about that for just a second. Because because many... um, Many of those who, who um, adhere to infant baptism see in our text here um, another support for the argument uh, that we have to become like children and, uh, and other, otherwise we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the parallel, um, which Peter mentioned earlier um, in when the, uh, when the children are coming to him and the disciples say, you know, get away. Um, I'm trying to remember where uh, oh there it is it's in the next chapter Matthew 19 13 then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray the disciples rebuked the people but Jesus said let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven and he laid his hands on them and and went away Um, when I went to the Presbyterian Seminary that I went to, uh, there were several uh, lines of argument pro-infant baptism. And uh, the first one at a Presbyterian school is covenant theology, uh, where if uh, children are uh, circumcised under the old covenant, therefore they should be baptized under the new because baptism replaces circumcision according to a very narrow reading of Colossians 2. Uh, that was one line of argument. Another line was Peter in Acts 2, where he says, you know, the promise is for you and for your children. They say it must be for children. But, you know, the, the biggest, like, proof text that I ever saw um, was, now well, maybe the second, maybe the second most important would be these two chapters here where Jesus is clearly pro-children. Um, and my thought is, well, he's pro-children, yeah. Um, but first... The biggest thing is he's pro-childlike faith. That's the first thing I'd say. And the second thing is, if you look for water in these verses, you are going to come up totally dry. (laughs) Because these are dry texts. (laughs) Um, It's just not, it's not there. He's not saying baptize children. He's saying, let them come to me. For to such belongs the kingdom. They're running to Jesus. And if there's any child in this church who runs to Jesus, I'm going to say, he, he will receive you. He loves you. He wants you. But they have to come to him. You know, we can't just, can't just force a covenant sign on them without them trusting in the Lord. That's not how it works. Um, and that practice, uh, which you know, became, became the norm in both the Western and the Eastern churches by four or 500, something like that, um, and then became a tradition that the, that the Protestant reformers largely upheld and kept to, but they had to put a different theology on it because they, because they couldn't hold to the, to the Western Catholic understanding of it or the Eastern Orthodox understanding of it. Um, if we strip away tradition and our desire to do whatever we can to guarantee our children's salvation, if we strip that away, we will find that there's just no evidence in the New Testament of this being Jesus as well. Um, Some will say, well, 
households are baptized in the book of Acts. Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't say that there are any infants in those households. It says that the households were baptized. Is it, a, is it a mom and dad with teenagers who were believing? That's possible. Anyway, I don't want to go, go too much into it. I just, um, this, ver- this set of verses and then in the next chapter in Matthew 19 are not related to infant baptism in the least. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the reason, like, it's part of the reason I'm a Baptist. Um, you know, theologically, I am a lot more in common theology proper uh, with people who come from the, the, you know, the Westminster Standards, old Lutheranism. Frankly, theology proper, I have a lot more in common with Roman Catholicism as well. Theology proper, meaning study of God, not all the ways that that works and all in, in a, uh, our ecclesiology and all that. Um, but ecclesiology, study of the church, that's, the, that's where the difference is. What is the church? Um, it seems to me that the New Testament says that the church is comprised of believers. And uh, all of those in a local church is a set of believers who have covenanted together to walk this pilgrim journey following Jesus. Um, and it's for believers, and anybody who trusts can get in but they have to believe. Yeah, I'm reading this word this morning and we have something to say about the, the whole idea of you know, children in this field, children being baptized in the infant where uh, does not give any sign of grace in the heart of salvation. Right. And what happens and they end up being able to partake of the Lord's Supper, yeah. which is primarily meant for people who convert. Yeah. And, then, uh, and the whole danger behind that is also what makes up the church. You know? In England, it's the Anglican Church, you know, the head of the uh, now King Charles, mm-hmm. the Roman Catholic. Eastern Orthodox, they don't have a pope, but it's but it's always it's always um, it's always uh, local bishops, usually who are over uh, over the uh, the regional churches. So yeah. Can't be. Especially noted in you know Mexico and South America. Hmm. So anyway, the whole idea is having unconverted people. Yeah, yeah, well, um, and I can appreciate that, certainly. Um, Peter making the point that uh, Spurgeon in Morning and Evening has a good study on um, unconverted people, those who have not entered the process of coming to Christ, which includes public profession, baptism, um, that, uh, that it's, it's not only wrong but dangerous to take the Lord's Supper uh, from that perspective. And it is dangerous. I've shared with you before how I've seen people, I think, do this, take it in an unworthy manner, and it's, it's, uh, it's hurt them in different ways, as Paul says that it will. That being said, um, where I would maybe personally place uh, my, my emphasis uh, if I was teaching and dealing with this issue, it's probably the same thing that Spurgeon would do if you were preaching a sermon on this, is, is that the sacrament whether it's baptism or the Lord's Supper, is meant to be a visual picture of a real thing. Um, A sacrament is a mystery, meaning that it's not just a bare sign. It is um, grace-giving in a different sense than Roman Catholic sacerdotalism, where it actually is the avenue of blessing. It's grace-giving in that it reminds us of our salvation. Um, Baptism is meant to depict for us and for the world around us our burial and resurrection with Jesus. 
Um, and the Lord's Supper is meant to depict for us that it is because we each take of the body and blood of the Lord. We are the body of, uh, of the Lord. Um, and that kind of reality, um, the thing to which it points, our Lord does not want us to um, think of in an unworthy manner. So I guess my point is this. Um, to me, it's not about... Um, taking the, the sacraments or the ordinances, whatever you want to call it, uh, in an unworthy manner as much as it is um, understanding or relating to salvation realities in an unworthy manner. Um, have you really been buried and risen with Christ by faith? Um, can you really say that you've got the life of Jesus inside of you, and that is what makes you a part of the family of God throughout the world, as the Lord's Supper depicts. I always want to make sure that people, people understand these things and, uh, and are living these realities so that the, the sacraments are um, valuable and, uh, and helpful uh, to them. So anyway, <clears throat> but very good points. The, I think these are all important things. Um, let me just, let's go into one more section here, and then we'll, and then we're probably going to have to stop for the day. Um, the real pursuit we find in verses 7 to 9 of Matthew 18. So, first, childlikeness, let me, let me say, contra greatness. Childlikeness, contra greatness. Um, and we'll just put the heading over there like that. That's the, first, that's the first point he makes. The second point you'll see in verses 7 to 9, let's read. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, or literally in the Greek, stumbling blocks. For it is necessary that temptations come. And that's interesting. It's necessary that temptations come. It's not him saying that he puts stumbling blocks in our way. Um... But he's saying, living in a fallen world, which I will, for you to live in a fallen world, it's going to be a part of life. And they're in the end going to actually help you if you run to me when you come to that place. Anyway, for it's necessary that temptations come. <coughs> Excuse me. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled Think about that, to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. And so um, this is Jesus demonstrating for us what it is that we are to pursue alongside of childlikeness. That is, to use a dated term, but one that is scriptural and we should always um, be reminding ourselves of, holiness. True holiness. Contra... What's that? Worldliness? Yeah, but but it's saying, you know, cut off the hand or pluck out the eye, which is him saying remove triggers. He's not saying become pirates. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's saying that. He, he's saying, um, I don't want you to just look holy. I want you to actually be holy. And so, I wanted to say hypocrisy, contrary to uh, holiness, contrary to hypocrisy. But then the effect of that is often legalism. You know, where it's like, as long as I don't do this, I'm okay. And Jesus addressed that in the Sermon on the Mount, I think, when he said, uh, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, which you've taken to me. As long as I don't sleep with another man's wife, I can entertain lustful thoughts and fantasies and all that kind of stuff. Jesus says, you're already in danger if you're in that place. 
So what I want is for you to learn to fight the thoughts as they come, as they go through your head. Let them just travel through and go out. And then learn to think positively about the right things. He's saying, I want internal holiness. I think that's kind of similar, similar things going on here. All that to say, here's how we'll hedge our bets here. We'll say worldliness like Paul said. We'll say hypocrisy like I said. And legalism. They honor me with their lips, but what? Their hearts are far from me. Um, maybe I'll add inner holiness. Because the, t- the, the type of the, the type of holiness that would cause a person to remove sin triggers from their life is the kind of holiness that truly desires to be holy, to want to really walk with the Lord, um, to, to want to not want to sin, <laughs> right? That's what, that's what inner holiness is. It's to say, I know that I want certain things, and I know that I shouldn't want them, and I don't want them, I don't want to want them anymore. So, you know, this is especially pertinent for men today. If I've got a problem with purity when I'm on the internet, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna throw the computer out? Maybe that's maybe that's an option. Or maybe putting safeguards on. Um, where somebody else has the passcode and they can't, they don't tell it to me. Maybe, maybe that's what I do. I'm removing a trigger. Or if, um, if I've had a problem with drugs in the past and I've got, a, I've got friends who are gonna pull me back into that, maybe I have to say, I, I, we can't be friends anymore. Um, not because I hate you, actually I love you, but um, Sometimes following Jesus requires losing certain things. And Jesus is saying it is better to not have certain worldly liberties, but to be gaining spiritual liberty that's going to lead to eternal life than it is to have worldly liberties and to never grow. Um, So that's why, you know, the New Testament can say, Flee, for instance, sexual immorality. Flee. Run. Remove triggers. Same thing Jesus says. Um, Putting off, putting on. That's right. That's right. Um, Putting off, putting on. Very good. Flee. Sexual immorality. Um, Watch that nobody be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceptive. Um, It lies to us, and it can harden us. Uh, abstain from the passions of the flesh, Peter says, that wage war uh, against your soul. I mean, this is, like, to think in these kind of, like, um, active terms, um, where I flee sin if it presents itself to me, where I'm able to divert my attention when sin presents itself to me. And when I look at myself as a member of a covenant community, i.e. a local church, and my responsibility is to watch out for my brothers and sisters so that they are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, which is actually what he's going to get into in the next section here. That requires a real desire for closeness with Christ. I want to really be close to him. I don't want what the world wants anymore, and if I do, I see through those wants, and I'm beginning to be spiritually mindful of of my disjointed desires. I want what happens on the outside to be really consistent with with what's going on on the inside. And I'm not going to go after this kind of legalism that, um, again, that's that's merely outward, um, but isn't really driven by, uh, where religion isn't driven by fellowship with Jesus and walking with him. So, childlikeness, holiness. Um, Two of these 
major drivers of the life of the one who is going to walk uh, with the Lord. And it's 1035. Um, I mean, coming off a sabbatical here, I've been talking a whole lot, so I have a lot to say. That's why last week I didn't even, last week I didn't preach. I'm pretty sure I was up front talking for 20 minutes on Sunday morning. The call to worship was like 10 minutes. The Lord's Supper was like 10 minutes. Um, and then I get up here, and I'm just talking the whole time this morning. Uh, I do apologize for that, but <clears throat> um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it's been, uh, it's been uh, upbuilding and uh, beneficial on a spiritual level. Uh, any, any just quick thoughts before we, before we close? Take us home. Who, who, who what? Who is same sex attraction. Oh, I see. Yeah. And he walks so closely with, with Christ because the gift is so whatever. As you get older, as we get older, sometimes the things that tempt us don't seem so bad. Yeah. Right? So I really struggle with worry. Oh, everybody worries. But I have to struggle with it as much as he has to struggle with his sin. Yeah. I have to recognize it for what it is and cling to Christ and, and avoid the things Avoid the thoughts that then lead you to worry. Sure. So sometimes the, the nature of sin, you can't ever take it, put it on God. That's right. The big sin is just the little sin. Yeah, you know, um, and, and we know, you know, certain sins, if there are weightier matters of the law, there might be weightier sins, but they're all dangerous. You know, that's Jesus' point. Again, in that first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, he is saying that each of these things are dangerous. It's just that, to your point, some of us might have besetting weaknesses and sins that are different than the other person. So I think it's a beautiful example to bring up the same-sex attracted Christian. Some would hear me, hear that phrase, and would say, oh, you're a liberal. Um, and uh, I didn't say... The homosexual Christian. I said the same sex attracted Christian. Um, a person can walk with Jesus while having that attraction that they live hating. <laughs> hating that they love certain things and then daily um, doing battle with it if it's strong and then letting that be a driver to the Lord. Um, I just think that uh, I think that that kind of what people would call today nuanced construal of the battle is something that evangelicals need a, need a little more clarity on. Um, a person can have certain tendencies, um, but they but if they really want inner holiness, they're going to do everything that they can to try to make sure that those tendencies are not driving their life. Um, and that's what again spirit. I use the phrase mindfulness, but a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists use that phrase now. But I think there's a spiritual mindfulness where Christians can have a feeling or a thought and they can look at it and see through it. That's not who I am, and that's not going to advance me in the Lord. Who I am is a child of God who's growing in Christ-likeness. If I have this battle, that's the flesh. But I don't have to put on the old self. I can put on the new self. Um, and that, I, I just think that example of the same-sex attracted Christian is a, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very pertinent example today because we have them all over the place. And what we need to do a better job of is instead of saying, you know, you're going to hell because of this attraction, um, is to say, Jesus will welcome you if you begin to see through the attraction and say, he knows better than I know what I need. So help me, Lord, and he promises, promises that he will. All right, uh, that's enough out of me. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would teach us to think and act more soundly and consistently with Christ in his glorious yet merciful nature. May we be children in your hand, but growing, maturing children. Grow our faith and grow our um, sight of the glory of God in the face of Jesus so that that is more attractive than the fleeting pleasures of sin. 
And therefore, may we be a truly holy people, even if it means cutting off the sin triggers, like Jesus said to do. Because it's better to be missing certain things in this life if it means I'm going to gain eternity than it is to be in touch with things today but miss eternity. As we're going to worship in the coming minutes, prepare our hearts, O Lord, bless our fellowship, bless the worship in song, bless our prayer, bless our time in the word. We commit it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.